Good afternoon. Welcome to our daily Comet update for Friday, July 21st. What you're looking at now is a boom from a plume, and we'll have more on that later, and as well as some other uh, images from Jupiter, and the double, including the double whammy impacts of fragments Q and R. Uh, as a, just a schedule note, though, remember, as a reminder, tomorrow at 11 a.m. we will have our closing briefing of the Comet Impact Series, and uh, that's Eastern Time. When we have what we uh, What's expected is a dramatic plume from Fragment W's impact and a look at changes we're already seeing at the impact sites and uh, uh, how the impacts of Comet Shoemaker-Levy 9 have lived up to predictions. And joining us tomorrow, in addition to our regular panelists, will be Heidi Hamill of MIT and Melissa McGrath of the Space Telescope Institute. So let's move on to our panel today. With us here to my left is Dr. Robert West a scientist from the Jet Propulsion Laboratory and a leader of the team using the Wide Field Planetary Camera 2 to see what the dust from the comets is doing to Jupiter's atmosphere. To his left, Dr. Andrew Ingersoll, a scientist from Caltech and a member of the Wide Field and Planetary Camera 2 team, and will tell us about the booms and plumes on Jupiter resulting from the G-fragment impact. And back for yet another day, Dr. Eugene Shoemaker, a longtime comet watcher and co-discoverer of the comet Shoemaker-Levy 9, and an astronomer with the Lowell Observatory and with the U.S. Geological Survey. To his left, <coughs> excuse me, to his left, Dr. Lucy McFadden, University of Maryland and University of California, coordinator of the Worldwide Comet Observing Campaign and a visiting professor at the University of Maryland. And to her left, David Levy, co-discoverer of the comet and uh, also an author and a popular speaker on astronomy. And at this point, I'd like to turn the program over to Gene Shoemaker. Thanks, Don. Uh, well, the status now is that all the fragments that we could see at the telescope uh, have hit Jupiter. Uh, so uh, that part of the show is over, although I'll remind you that uh, there's still the following wing coming in, so we may not have seen all of the impact events. Uh, probably the most interesting observations right now are, are going to be presented by Bob West and his look at two fragments that happened at very nearly the same site. Bob? Could we have the first image? What I'll be showing in the first image is uh, a true color picture of the way Jupiter looked <coughs> soon after the fragment R hit Jupiter. And uh, the great red spot is clearly visible in it, this image as well. Uh, now I'll walk you through what we're seeing here. You can see the familiar 45 degrees south latitude. And on the very right edge of the planet, uh, passing over the limb, is the, the remains of uh, the impact from fragment L. That happens to be a fairly big uh, region that L is covering. Then the next uh, to the blow and to the left of the great red spot, there's a dark area that is the remains of what we saw from the G and D impacts. Originally, uh, we saw them very well distinctly separated. But here we see a much more complex region. They seem to be moving together and evolving. Uh, then to the left of those, there's a very dark spot, <coughs> a little bit left of the center uh, of the central meridian of Jupiter, the central longitude. That dark spot is the new one. That's the R impact. And uh, it's not as close as we might have expected at first to the, uh, to the other ones, but, but there it is. Then uh, to the left of that is the impact from Q1. And further over is uh, the impact from H, which al is also a very large spot. Uh, very careful inspection of these images also shows some much smaller features. Uh, we can see the, the B feature in here and the N feature. Uh, and uh, I've seen a more recent image, which we didn't have time to, to prepare for this. But <coughs> it also shows the <coughs> S impact region, which is about halfway between R and uh, DG complex, the S looks very much like R does. Now, the, the R and S uh, sites are not as large as some of the other ones. Uh, they're kind of the, in the median range. We see much smaller uh, impact events, and we see much larger ones. Uh, I want you to carefully look at this image, take a note, mental note of the size of what we're seeing. We're seeing uh, the core dark regions here, mostly. It, we, you can barely see away from these some faint uh, darkish patches, uh, which show regions where we have ejecta of dust material that spread widely but thinly over the planet. Now, th these visible images are nice to look at, but we're learning a lot more from other wavelengths that we can't see. 
the ultraviolet and the infrared. And I'll show you the next image is one taken in the ultraviolet. This is in the near ultraviolet, a little bit shortward of where uh, the visible atmosphere blocks uh, sunlight coming into the Earth's atmosphere. This is at uh, 2550 angstroms for those of you who know what that means. But uh, what I want to show you here is, is uh, these very large sites that we can see in the ultraviolet. You see uh, two of them. Um, the, I think it's L on the right, and again, D and G closer to the center, uh, which are very large uh, regions covered very widely by mostly what we're seeing here is dark absorbing dust, which shows up very well in the ultraviolet. Uh, we also see a lot of other features in this image, and I'd like to move on to the, the next one, which shows now all the features that we see just in this one image. I also want to remark here that there is a <coughs> uh, circular black feature to the north of Jupiter's center. That's Jupiter's moon Io, which is also very dark in the ultraviolet. Here we see it uh, in front of Jupiter. So here we can see on the right the huge feature from L, uh, D and G, R, Q2, uh, Q1, rather, I was, I was right first, Q2, then Q1 moving towards the left, N, B, and H is just coming on uh, on the left. Uh, some of these smaller features are too small to see in this uh, televised version, but we can see them when we look closely at the images. Now, I think this, this is significant in terms of what we're able to see in Jupiter's stratosphere. These big black splotches are not holes in the clouds. They're not waves. Uh, they're mostly dark particles and also some UV-absorbing gases that appear uh, on Jupiter's atmosphere. And the significant part is that we're seeing them high in the atmosphere in the stratosphere. This is the first time we've ever had markings like this in the stratosphere. And we can use these clouds to trace the winds and to measure the circulation of the stratosphere. So it's going to be very important for Jupiter science, and this is just the beginning. We're just now starting to examine some of the motions that we see, and we have more observations coming up uh, all the way into August, which will tell us a, a great deal of information about the stratospheric circulation. Uh, so we have a lot coming in the long term, but we also have a lot of exciting results in the near term. And uh, at this point, I'd like to turn it over to Andy Ingersoll. Or actually, back to you, Gene. Well, I will turn it over to Andy then. <laughs> uh, we're we're going to hear about the boom. Uh, I think I, I'd rather call it just a very low frequency sound wave. Uh, I hope people will not think of this as a sonic uh, boom. It, the sonic boom is a shock wave, and that's not what Andy's going to tell us about. <laughs> right. Um, just think uh, perhaps of a uh, flash of lightning. A little while later, you hear the sound from the, from the thunder. And uh, if you were on Jupiter, you would hear some sound from these explosions. Uh, you'd hear a huge sound wave if you're close, but if you're farther away, it would take some time to get to you. And uh, in fact, it uh, propagates at the speed of sound. And we know something about the speed of sound in Jupiter's atmosphere. It actually depends on uh, whether uh, you're traveling up, up the sound is traveling in the stratosphere or at deeper levels. And uh, so we hope to use the information about the measured speed of sound from these waves to tell us uh, where the wave is traveling, whether it's traveling in the stratosphere or down deeper. Um, let's show the familiar, by now familiar, uh, G-impact site. Uh, some of you have studied this, and um, you can see sort of to the southeast, a big uh, horseshoe-shaped uh, pile of material, which is probably uh, the ejecta that was flung out in, into space and then fell down onto the atmosphere. Inside that, there's a little elliptical region that I want to <coughs> talk about. And of course, off to the uh, northwest is the D-impact site uh, from an earlier uh, fragment. So let's see the next. Uh, this is what the G-impact site would look like if you were directly above it. You can see that circle, that prominent circle, is uh, indeed circular, which is uh, what you get from a wave spreading outward from a single explosion. Now, this picture uh, was taken about an hour and a half after the impact, and the radius of that circle is about 4,000 kilometers, and 
you can compute uh, how fast that wave is going. It's about uh, 800 meters per second, which is the speed of sound uh, of hydrogen gas in the stratosphere of Jupiter. It all, that speed also matches uh, a, another kind of stratospheric wave, a gravity wave. But either way, it's a wave in the stratosphere. Now, if you study that image very carefully, inside that prominent circle, there's an even smaller circle, very faint. And you might, uh, and we, we do suspect that that's a wave deeper down that's giving us some indication of its existence. And uh, we can uh, tell that it's deeper down because it's propagating slower. Uh, the inference from all this is that uh, this comet has excited a stratospheric wave much more than it has excited a wave deeper down. And that suggests that the comet is uh, lost most of its energy high up in the atmosphere, not down deep. I've also got a video of this uh, just to convince you that this wave is indeed expanding outwards. Uh, we've got a series of images in different filters. The time step is uh, three to five minutes between filters, and uh, we can use it as a little movie uh, that uh, over this very brief span of time in a sequence designed to look for color, we can use it instead to look for uh, uh, time dependence. Now maybe we'll see it a little faster, and I think you can see that wave is spreading outwards. A little problem with the alignment there. And uh, this sort of, this is the sort of thing we want to do uh, with images in our future analysis in order to figure out some of the properties of Jupiter's atmosphere, uh, especially at the levels that we can't see, uh, and uh, decide where the comet deposited its energy. Now, also I have some uh, measurements of the <coughs> balloon velocities. Uh, next. Uh, we can look at sort of a cross-section of Jupiter's atmosphere. This shows you uh, the different cloud layers in the next uh, video. Uh, the different cloud layers um, down at the bottom. Uh, in fact, the clouds of Jupiter are rather thin. Uh, the three parallel bands at the bottom are only uh, 100 kilometers thick. At the bottom is the water cloud. And I've shown the uh, comet going through that water cloud. Uh, that's actually controversial. In fact, I don't believe it anymore. I think, in fact, the comet did not go through the water cloud. Uh, above that is the cloud containing sulfur uh, in the form of ammonium hydrosulfide. And then above that is the ammonia cloud, which blocks our vision from space normally. And then the comet came in from left to right. That's from south to north in this image. Uh, and then rebounded back out along uh, the path it went in and sent up this huge plume. Now, if you look at that picture, I've got one line labeled visible from Earth. That's because it's, uh, Earth is over the horizon. And so you can't see the ground from Earth, or you can't see the cloud deck up at this point on the planet from Earth. You can only see a place higher in the atmosphere. Now, look up higher, you can see the sun is also over the horizon. And so the plume does not pop into the sunlight until it gets about uh, 2,500 kilometers above the cloud deck. Uh, and this is all graphically displayed in an animation of the plume uh, uh, as, as, again, a filter, multi-filter sequence. You can see the first two frames will show you the plume when it's visible from Earth, but not yet in the sunlight. It's, at this point, it's glowing <laughs> red from its own heat. It's still glowing red. Then it pops into the sunlight on the next frame and has a sort of a half moon shape. Uh, hmm. There we go. A little there half moon shape where <coughs> the top half of it is in sunlight and uh, the bottom half is invisible because it's in darkness. Uh, the camera has rescaled itself uh, to see the much brighter light from the scattered sunlight than the uh, glowing red of the uh, original plume. And then it falls back and pancakes out on the atmosphere. <laughs> the speed is about 
five kilom the upward velocity is five perhaps more kilometers per second, uh, and it, as I said, it goes up uh, 2,500 kilometers into the atmosphere. From this sort of information combined with a hydrodynamic model, we can uh, get some handle on again on how big the impact was and how deep it went. Back to you, Gene. Okay, that's really exciting, Andy. Uh, let's turn now to uh, David Levy, who's going to give us an update on, on amateur sightings uh, of the features uh, being formed by impacts. Yeah, finally I can say that I did get to a telescope last night, it cleared up, and um, I got to a series of them, ranging from the uh, U.S. Naval Observatory's 26-inch refractor, which is not really the kind of telescope that most amateur astronomers would have in their backyards. I actually found it easier to see the impact sites, the spots, using the finder of that telescope uh, because the, s the uh, atmospheric turbulence was very strong last night in, in here in Washington. And it was difficult to, uh, to actually to get the image of Jupiter steady enough so that I could see the spots. But when I went to a smaller telescope, the finder of the telescope, and then looking through some very small amateur telescopes placed outside the observatory, I was able to see the spots very, very clearly. And I wasn't the only one. Uh, I was with a seven-year-old who was also looking through the telescope. Uh, I didn't tell him where to look. He said, wow, look at those spots. <laughs> uh, I have a very crude dra drawing um, <laughs> that I did. Notice that the spots are at the top. This one here is the, this one here, and this one is the spot from G, and the spot from L is over here and very clearly seen. They're by far the most obvious features on Jupiter right now. Uh, I have also reports from people seeing these spots through telescopes as small as 40 millimeters aperture. Virtually any telescope will show these through almost any observing conditions. And uh, I think since we have a lot to do, I'll, I'll give it back to what you. What about high power binoculars? Yeah. I tried, and I couldn't. Couldn't do it. Uh, oh, wait, I have to retract that. 10 by 50? No, I tried, but I was looking at Venus. <laughs> <laughs> Lucy, you're supposed to know where Jupiter is. <laughs> you saw a crescent instead. Yes. <laughs> okay. I went inside puzzled. <laughs> well, why don't you give us an update then? Okay. Yeah, back to uh, more electronic images, which is what I can deal with better than eyeball <laughs> images. Um, the weather is, seems to be hampering observations around the world. Um, both Saratololo and Chile report clouds and snow. Um, this is a novel way to bring you the world's weather from the astronomical observatories. And then Hurricane Amelia shut down the telescopes at the summit of Mauna Kea. Nevertheless, we do have a last, an image from NASA's infrared telescope showing the impact of fragment R. And there are six uh, impact sites that are visible here. Um, and I think we're going to be uh, calling in the uh, armada of ground-based observers to help us uh, keep track and monitor the spots, because I certainly am getting confused, and it's hard for me to keep track of which that, that is which. Which satellite is that? That must be that, one of Yes, satellites. that's right, absolutely. And on the top right is, I believe it's Io, based on the uh, ultraviolet images, which I bet were taken earlier, when Io was further over to the left of the screen. Um, this is an infrared image, and Io is, um, is hot, so therefore it, come, it shows up as a bright spot here. Um, we have from the Keck telescope uh, a nine-panel mosaic of images of fragment R again. And uh, boy, this is just food for, for astronomers and, and scientists for, for years. Um, these are uh, images starting at um, Oh, wavelengths at one micron and increasing up to four microns. And as I mentioned yesterday, at each wavelength, we're seeing a little bit deeper into the atmosphere. Um, and also, we're seeing a time sequence here. Um, so it's, it's a little bit more complicated, seeing time and, uh, and uh, at atmospheric depth of variations. Um, let's see, I want to go through these quickly. We have a, a, an image from Lowell Observatory of the same impact 
where the fragment, uh, that is the R impact, and the fragment plume is just seen coming over into view in the lower left limb of the planet. It's just that very subtle bump on the, on the limb there. Right. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then Io is moved off of the disk of uh, the planet there, and it's in the upper right. Uh, McDonald Observatory, uh, another view of fragment R, um, but this is for more in the visible, uh, well, no, I'm sorry, in the near infrared, starting at, at uh, 8,290 angstroms uh, and continuing out to 3.3 microns. Um, and again, these are very dramatic pictures, and I, I, I certainly uh, can't do an instant analysis on these, but this is uh, food for all of us to work with. Uh, over the next year. Um, then we have Spirex from the South Pole. Um, and th this actually is an image of fragment L showing six views in a, in a time sequence. And we are, this complements what Andy Ingersoll showed us earlier, um, where we're, we can see the evolution of the plume. It, it, um, although these are, this is still evolution at a different time period because it's facing the Earth at this time. But, but you can, you do see initially a bright, a flash, then it grows in brightness, and then we can see it decay. And, and we're going to extract uh, a lot of information about the physics of this impact and the energies and the altitudes to which they um, will go down, to which the impacts, the fragments have, have uh, propagated. You probably should say that the very bright feature you see is actually right on the limb at that time. That that's, the, that, that's really the bright phase of the fireball routine. Thank you. Um, now we have a, a report from the Kuiper Airborne Observatory, and um, I, let's turn to them as soon as they're ready. Dr. Gordon Boryaker of Goddard Space Flight Center uh, has, report, has a report, and I'll let you listen to his voice reporting it first. And it's exciting. I can't Everything worked that. beautifully. There was a little trouble with the telescope, but uh, the team fixed that in short order. The equipment worked Hunt. beautifully. And we got uh, <coughs> some very nice spectra, uh, infrared spectra, of the R spot, and found uh, some emissions that haven't, to my knowledge, been reported yet from this event uh, due to uh, acetylene and ethane. Uh, we think that uh, this is uh, caught, these uh, enhanced emissions are caused by heating of the stratosphere by the comet impact. The infrared spectra that we're seeing uh, suggests to us simply that when the comet hits the atmosphere, it explodes uh, at rather high altitudes, deposits all its energy there. And the major cause of the effects we're seeing is that the, uh, that the atmosphere is heated from, uh, heated by maybe uh, 100 degrees Fahrenheit, hotter than its uh, normal temperature for a period of a few hours. Okay, now I want to leave up this graphic or have you look at the graphic because what we're seeing there is um, the emission lines are not, you see a bright bar going across in most of those uh, stacked images. The emission lines are the fainter feature that features that are seen above it. The bright bar is Jupiter. Can, can we have the uh, spectrum back, please? Advance the uh, frames, please. Okay. Um, let me go on because there's. Um, I have some other things that I can report which we don't have visuals. Um, you're probably all interested in the last impacts. Um, U and V were reported as 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 fizzles basically, but but the W impact was definitely significant. Um, Spirex reported it as to be as the, as energetic as fragment E, um, but I can't remember how how bright fragment E was. But got the spectra back. Okay. Now we have the we have the spectra back from the Kuiper Airborne Observatory, um, and I just want you to, to take a minute to to look at hmm hmm hmm. hmm. Yeah. <laughs> where does anyone want care to point out where the methane emission bands are? Um, the bottom two bars um, show bright um, faint bright spots. Hmm. That must. This is tough. I'm, I'm guessing here that they have a, one direction is along the direction of Jupiter and the other is in the, spa is in the spectral yeah. dimension. We assume I that the, the, the vertical bands must be the lines. 
You've got and, and the emission features. Yeah. Now I'm starting to see absorption lines too. Right. Um, well, we uh, we're still trying to assimilate this. We're gonna have to, we're gonna have to talk to the scientists. And again, this just illustrates the the wealth of information um, that that is present in the data that's been collected from all around the world. I mean, we, we, can't, we can't do an instant interpretation of it, much less even a brief description. It's, it's proving to be difficult. Um, uh, the other thing that I wanted to report that came in um, late last night was a, was a provisional citing of, of evidence of water. Um, this was reported by Roger Kanaki, Tim Brooke, and Tom Gabal at the United Kingdom Infrared Telescope. They reported an emission line at 2.407 microns during the R impact. And we, they want to stress that it is a provisional identification uh, because uh, as one of the Hubble scientists um, mentioned to me before, one line does not identify a chemical species. Um, however, there is a line at this wavelength that is due to H2O, water. Um, it's, it's very exciting and we will look more and look at other wavelengths um, and look for evidence, uh, get a secure identification of water. We have, there are reports of secure identifications of the molecule CO, uh, carbon monoxide. This is the first reporting of any chemical species containing oxygen. It has been, we had preliminary reports from, the, from radio astronomers throughout the week and we have also confirmation from infrared observers um, at, I believe it was uh, Marsha Riki, and it was infrared emission bands uh, attributable to, to CO, carbon monoxide. Um, so the chemical reports are, are just beginning to come in and we're appreciating the, the power of, of spectroscopy to help us interpret the chemistry. And I think I'll stop there. Okay, that's great, Lucy. I'd, I'd like to add one. I tried to get Lucy to talk about this, but she was she demurred. Uh, there's a very interesting report uh, from Ellen Howell at the University of Arizona. Uh, she reports seeing a very large dark ring uh, surrounding an impact site, uh, but uh, we're not sure that she's identified the right site. Uh, this ring gets to be about 90 degrees across. So it goes all the way to the pole, and she reports seeing the ring move in successive images over the course of about an hour. Now, we're not sure whether she saw the ring move all the way from close to the impact point to that distance or not. That has to be confirmed. Uh, if she did, that would be the speed appropriate for uh, a seismic ring. Uh, but that may be premature. Uh, we really have to check with Ellen and find out how, how far she saw it move. But we have heard that observers at Lick Observatory have also seen uh, this large ring. So uh, if that proves to be the uh, seismic uh, wave that's been refracted from deeper than the interior people, <coughs> that would be extraordinarily exciting. It's a little bit early to say that, uh, but in any case, we're, people have been seeing waves recorded on the surface at very large distances from the impact site. That seems to be secure. Yeah, could you, could you um, clarify exactly how much of Jupiter this, this Ring is goes all the way from over the pole to about to the equator, so it's it's, it's a covering huge half the planet. Ring. So it's that's right. It's mm -hmm. covering a, a, a quarter of the planet here. Yeah, here. Quarter, right, yeah. and that means it's uh, sampled depths where the pressure is a million atmospheres and all sorts of exotic places. If, if it really has done that, and it's and it's not one of your sound waves going out there that's just late in the well, I, I hope for those guys. Ah, right? oh, me too. <laughs> yeah. Well, we should be getting confirmations of this as time to over the next couple of days. So. Yeah, yeah. But it sounds, it sounds very exciting. Stay tuned for tomorrow. Right. <laughs> uh, hope, hopefully we'll have a, uh, a more complete report on that tomorrow. Uh, Don, I think uh, we should bring it back to you at this point. Sure. And uh, before we get started on the q and I'm told that we now have uh, ready to to roll the uh, reports from IUE, and um, if you can, you want to go ahead and introduce those. We can okay, we, those. we have some um, reports that I, I got excited and brought in some other things that were out of the program, but we do have reports from the International Ultraviolet Explorer, the little telescope that could, that's uh, been, been working for 15 years in Earth orbit. Um, 
the two members of the team have... have uh, we've been observing the comet collision with right. Jupiter using the IUE satellite as part of a very large campaign that has three separate U.S. science teams and a European science team. Uh, we've been observing 24 hours a day since the impacts began, and we've been using the unique capability of the IUE satellite to observe upper atmospheric effects from the comets 24 hours a day. We began in June to take a number of spectra of the planet without any comet having hit it so that we would have an idea of what to compare with. These spectra were obtained back in late June and early July before the comet hit Jupiter. This green spectrum is the far ultraviolet light that came from Jupiter's atmosphere at a location close to the dawn limb or edge of Jupiter. This first green spectrum was taken on the dawn limb at about 40 minutes after the impact occurred. And this second red spectrum here was taken on the dusk limb about three and a half to four hours later. And these wiggles are indicative of changes in the composition of the atmosphere that presumably are due to the comet passing through it and releasing a tremendous amount of energy. There was a considerable amount of darkening that occurred. And what we think we're seeing here is we're seeing that the evolution of a dark region, the sort of dark region that people have been seeing in the ultraviolet HST images. Okay, that was Dr. Walter Harris from the University of Michigan. And we have one more. Um, this is Dr. Hill. Hilda Ballester. We did find emission related to the, to the impact of this fragment, but in addition, we found an extended trail of emission, very extending thousands of kilometers away from the planet. Originally, we thought this was associated with the plume phenomena, but with subsequent observations, we realized that what we're imaging is, in fact, the train of the comet as it approaches Jupiter. Um, this is really a very spectacular result because IUE right now is the only instrument that can, in fact, image the comet train. And I want you to realize that although all the major fragments have impacted Jupiter, there is still an extended wing of the comet uh, approaching the planet. And we plan to image it for many days to come to try to identify what are the processes producing this emission. So that, uh, her, the observations of, of IUE that <coughs> Dr. Ballester was reporting on were uh, observations off the edge of the planet, and she was looking along the trail of the comet. Um, she was, they believe they are seeing ultraviolet emission extending above the edge of the planet along the trail of the comet. So this is, no one else, everyone else has been looking at the comet. Um, she's okay, I think we're ready for a Q&A here at uh, Goddard. <coughs> Yeah, uh, Dr. Shoemaker, um, yesterday uh, the Committee of Congress uh, approved and authorized a, uh, uh, an activity by NASA in which they would set up uh, um, uh, radar sets to, to search for, for Earth, possible Earth impacting uh, comets or asteroids or boulders of some sort. Um, how practical uh, and appropriate do you think uh, such an activity, which has cost the country about $50 million, is? And secondly, uh, kind of a follow-up to that, have you learned anything uh, from this particular comet that uh, might, that might uh, assist such an enterprise? Okay, well, let me clarify what the actual language of the amendment is. Uh, NASA was request, is being requested in the amendment to, to, in, to the authorization bill for NASA uh, to report back to Congress by February 1 on a plan uh, to, s to carry out a search or survey and catalog uh, the Earth-crossing objects larger than one kilometer. Uh, and, I, and I'm sure it's the intent of Congress then to then act upon that plan, uh, probably with uh, uh, funding in fiscal 1996. So, n so Congress is asking NASA to come back with a plan. They have not specified what that should be. Uh, however, I'm sure that uh, they have very much in mind the recommendations of the Morrison report, uh, which brought, which, uh, which was also a report in response to a uh, congressional request uh, that laid out a plan for a series of optical observatories, not radar, but optical observatories, to 
to enhance the rate of discovery over what's being accomplished now. Uh, and uh, that, that report's been widely available now for almost two years. Uh, it was chaired by David Morrison. It had a group of about 50 people that contributed to that report and very carefully considered how one could effectively search uh, the skies and carry out a survey for the objects, particularly the asteroidal objects, uh, which might hit the Earth, and, and carry out that survey for the ones that would be potentially have the ones that would potentially have global consequences. So, uh, I'm confident that what NASA is going to do now is is to review that recommendation, and and uh, come back with a very specific plan uh, to Congress at the time uh, requested, which would be early next year. I'll wait for the mic, please. Uh, has anything been learned from, from this particular impact that would um, increase the understanding of, uh, of how to go about this, this catalog survey and what might possibly be done in, in case a, an Earth impacting uh, object is found? Uh, <laughs> what we've learned from this event is that, yes, Virginia, comets hit planets. <laughs> and I think that had a lot to do with the, uh, with the amendment that's just been put forward this week. Uh, in terms of uh, how we should do that in detail, no, our observations of the impact event have not helped, but of course our discovery of this comet in the first instance is a part of, of an ongoing program uh, that is in fact, you might call it the precursor to such a plan. It's being carried out at a much uh, more modest level. Andy, you were going to comment. Well, I'd like to make a comment and get your reaction. Okay. Um, Jupiter is a much bigger target than the Earth, so it's more likely to get hit. That's right. Uh, it's physically <coughs> bigger. It's got a bigger cross-section. Uh, its gravitational field is bigger, so it attracts objects. And then it accelerates them, so you get more bang for the same size buck, right? Right. So we really shouldn't assume that the same kind of impacts are going to occur on Earth in our lifetime, or at least that it's that it's likely that such things will happen on Earth in our lifetime. And I'd like to know, when will the Earth get hit? In your, when, in your opinion, will the Earth get hit by similar size energy, uh, by events of the same energy? Right. Well, you've missed some of our previous NASA Select uh, broadcasts well. <laughs> where we discussed that very issue. Right. Uh, there is, of course, a connection in between the frequency at Jupiter and the frequency at Earth. Uh, and as, as we mentioned before, uh, I think the precursor for this thing was about a 10 kilometer sized body, and I think that we get hits like that about once every thousand years on Jupiter. So we are kind of lucky. This is not a common everyday, you know, every decade event. This is a fairly rare event on Jupiter that we're witnessing. A corresponding event on the Earth uh, is about once in a hundred million years. So there's a huge difference in the rate at which these, uh, the Im comparable impacts happen on the Earth and on Jupiter. However, if a comet hits the Earth, the typical collision velocity for a long period comet, which are the ones that dominate the flux at the Earth, is about 60 kilometers per second. Yeah. It's being accelerated by the Sun, of course, not by the Earth, uh, but it's very similar, interestingly okay. enough, to the speed on Jupiter. And also, uh, I think the interest uh, expressed by Congress yesterday was not for just 10 kilometer objects, but for objects as small as one kilometer. That's right a little more than half mile wide objects. That's right. So we're talking about things that have uh, a, a sufficiently high rate of impact about once per 100,000 years, actually. So the odds are a little bit more, a little bit lower than one chance in a thousand that one of these one kilometer guys might hit during the lifetime of people now living. But, but if there is one, the statistics are irrelevant. Why we have to look for it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, Lucy, you're right you on it. <laughs> uh, hi. Uh, now that all the fragments are down, I just have a couple of basic questions about what this poor battered planet looks like. Are all the impacts, are they strung out all the way around the southern hemisphere? Are they bunched in one place? And are the earlier impacts, like A, which was so unexpectedly impressive, are they dissipating into haze or are they, they still have some integrity? What is it? What does it really look like? I think the, the comet is, is battered all in a band. I mean, I know it is all right. the way around the planet. I'm sorry. <laughs> the planet is, is battered in a band all the way around the southern hemisphere. 
And I'm going to let one of the Hubble Space Telescope people respond to the evolution of the impact site. Uh, yeah, actually, there is some clustering. Not all the kits are equally spaced. And the, the picture that we see here has more than its average share of hits. Um, but nevertheless, they are uh, essentially at all longitudes. They're all near the 45 south degree latitude region. And I think we're going to see uh, these, the, the haze particles and gases that absorb light, they're going to spread out in the stratosphere, just like in the case of the big volcanic eruption into the Earth's stratosphere. Over a period of time, weeks, months, and even more than a year, I expect we'll still be seeing particles as they spread further and further. And by virtue of the fact of, of seeing them spread, we'll learn a lot about the stratosphere of Jupiter. These particles are also absorbing sunlight, and they will contribute to uh, heating the stratosphere in addition to the heat that's being dumped there, essentially immediately from the energy of the impact. So in the thermal infrared, I expect we'll see higher than average temperatures in the stratosphere for quite some time to come. And Possibly, uh, the, the effects may even be large enough to have some effect on the stratospheric circulation. So we'll be looking for all those things. And while, while you're saying that, this is, this is a, a great time, not just for uh, large telescopes, but to complement the space telescope and other instruments, amateur astronomers with good instruments and with CCDs or simple cameras should be photographing Jupiter to get the large synoptic view over time. Uh, right down, a lot of the large telescopes so stop seeing Jupiter in another month or so, and it starts getting really close to the sun, and they simply won't be able to get to it. But smaller telescopes and amateur scopes will. It is very important for amateurs with cameras to continue photographing Jupiter as far into the sun as they can. Yeah. And then pick we it up we are already the losing track of who's who in this rogues gallery, and yet, uh, in other words, we get... Uh, uh, G confused with H yeah. now, and uh, uh, if we're going to study the long-term evolution of these things and do some Jovian meteorology, we'd like to keep track of who's who. Yeah. So, it's yeah, so we, we, we need really an archive of, of photographs taken on an hourly basis from all over the world. Bob. I'm Bob Cook from Newsday. Uh, for Andy Ingersoll, isn't it unusual to be able to see a sound wave? I can s hear thunder but never see it. I can hear sonic booms and, and not see them. What's happening? Uh, you're right on. Um, we were lucky to see the sound wave. Something has to condense in Jupiter's atmosphere. Some material has to uh, form a cloud in order to see it. And uh, from the color of this cloud and its general appearance, uh, it appears that we are seeing condensation of that same ugly brown material that uh, was thrown out by the comet. And so uh, that stuff settled out in the stratosphere of Jupiter. And as the wave went by, it caused some of it to condense. Uh, and I think we're lucky. Some of the equally large uh, impacts uh, did not leave a uh, visible uh, wave. And yet, we know the wave was there. Uh, from infrared image, we are seeing many uh, impact sites remaining. And the first question is, how hot was the owl impact? And the, what happening about the impact site of A? You know, it's one week ago. And how hot was the impact site A? And how long does it take to become a you know, normal uh, degree? OK, I, I'm afraid I'm going to give you a frustrating answer. Um, I'm not confident giving numbers from other people's images. Um, and in fact, what the scientists are going to do next week is, is hole up with their data and perform careful calibrations and, and get, get some real numbers. Um, and there, there is, we have observed in a quantitative manner that it brightens and then decays for a while. But, but yet, there are still images, there, there's still remnant heat at the impact sites after Jupiter rotates around, and we can, we can see re repetition of the impact sites. So they do stay at some temperature, but I can't give you numbers right now. I, I think it's fair to say, a after a period of a day or so, as you look at the older sites, mostly what we're seeing is, is sunlight and infrared light from the sun being reflected uh, from those sites. So the, 
the intense emissions from the heat dies away fairly quickly, although, as Lucy said, there's still, still some residual warmth. I mean, those spots are warmer than normal uh, in the atmosphere. I'll yeah. bet we can see some of these storms uh, a year later. Uh, mm -hmm. Jupiter, after all, Jupiter has a 300-year-old storm. I see no uh, reason why these storms shouldn't last for a long time. Mark? Uh, this is Mark Rowe of the Houston Chronicle for Dr. McFadden. Um, could you tell us uh, from the report you have about how closely the grouping was for Q's R and S and also speak to why a couple of the last ones seem to uh, sputter, as you said? Okay. Um, I, I don't have any reports of what we were expecting of seeing a, a nice uh, shield image from the impacts of Q, R, and S. We seem to be able to resolve them as discrete impact sites. Um, um, let's see, now I forgot your, your other question, which I had the answer for immediately. Uh, it was the, uh, a couple of the last ones you said. Oh, why did they fizzle? Yes, yeah. why did they sputter out? Well, our, our immediate uh, hypothesis that like fragment B, which did not create a big scar, big impact, that uh, U and V uh, quite possibly are uh, not as massive or the mass is distributed over a larger area and they did not create, did not make the big, the big bang. They, they exploded higher in the atmosphere? I'm not exactly sure. If Anyone you, else want to comment? Little guys. They if were little guys. If you look That's behind it, <laughs> unfortunately, w it's a bit flag. behind the flag. Uh, can, can, can somebody move uh, that no. so we can see it? No, no let's uh, go for You it, can please. see some, they are very tiny. Com we knew that to begin with. They're right over there near the very end of the mosaic. W is off of it. And you can see that they're much fainter than the other, as, as seen in this image, which was taken in January. Uh, these are much fainter objects. We expected them to be much smaller. But W is pretty big. W is pretty yeah. big. It's, well, off it's off the line. It's off this um, picture. Right. And W, the, the impact from W was as bright as fragment E. Um, so that's, that's like a medium-sized impact. Uh, Jim, Jim Reston for Esquire. Dr. Ingersoll, I, I assume you, what you said and what Don Hunton said and others that the consensus is growing that these things have exploded higher in the at atmosphere. That solves the mystery of why water has not been uh, seen in abundance uh, along the way. But I wanted to go on from the details to theory now as we um, uh, come near the end of our week together. There was a lot of talk about the possibility of the formation of new cyclones from this uh, thing before it began. And I wondered, as you've been watching the, um, the scene this week, whether your thinking has been advanced about the formation of cyclones on uh, Jupiter, whether they could have been caused by cometary impact. And if indeed you have uh, uh, grown stronger in that feeling, how big would a comet have to be or an asteroid have to be to create the big red spot? Um, when you watch uh, Jupiter <coughs> through a Voyager images, which is really a 60-day history of the planet's uh, weather, you see spots being born and uh, merging with each other, uh, which is a form of uh, death. Uh, you see this process going on all the time. And uh, I don't think, it, I, I, let's say this, it's premature to conclude that most of those spots uh, were formed by cometary impact. Uh, there's plenty going on to form spots. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the big question is why do these spots, which are just storms in the atmosphere, why do they last so long? Uh, and we're working on that, and one of the things we've not known about is what are the conditions deep down, because we can't really apply weather forecasting models unless we know those conditions. So uh, I think we're going to learn a lot from the longevity of these spots. And I'm hoping some of them last a long time, but either way, we're going to learn something about how long they last. Uh, I think, in particular, we're going to see the outer material drift away in the Jovian winds in a matter of weeks, but the uh, 
one or two thousand kilometer diameter central core of many of them will last. Uh, just to make that very clear in my mind, the fact that they are exploding above the water layer means that they're not getting in deep enough to really address the question of whether cyclones can be <coughs> formed by comets. Is that correct? Well, we didn't design this experiment. Uh, someone else did. <laughs> uh, and yes, I probably would have uh, chosen to put the energy down deeper. Uh, uh, of course, that's still an open question. Uh, but um, I still think I, I'm completely confident we're going to learn something about the dynamics of the weather on Jupiter. Uh, I, I would have preferred some energy in the water clouds. We don't know how uh, deep the red spot goes. It could just be a creature of the upper cloud deck or of the water clouds, and it could go much deeper. Uh, the energy in the red spot is just the kinetic energy of those winds going around is about comparable to the energy of, the, of a several kilometer sized comet. However, uh, you have to efficiently couple the energy of a comet into swirling motion, and uh, it's unlikely that you're going to do that very efficiently. I think there's something we can add to that, and that is uh, I also think we'll see a very long life features, but I think they're going to owe their longevity to something entirely different than the longevity of what we've been used to seeing in Jupiter. I think they're going to be long alive because they reside in the stratosphere, uh, which is a stably stratified layer. It's, it takes a long time for particles to fall out of the stratosphere, and I think it's for that reason that they're going to be long alive, not for the same reasons that the Great Red Spot has a long life. So we're going to be learning totally new things here. And to my mind, that's why this is so exciting. Take one more question here, move to KSC, and come back. <coughs> um, Terry Tamura from NHK, Japan Broadcasting. Um, I want to get back to the sound waves. Um, by studying the sound waves, what can you learn about the Jupiter? What are you trying to um, imply by this? I, I really uh, brushed over that a little fast. There are really several kinds of waves. Uh, there's sound wave propagating uh, near the base of the stratosphere, and uh, there are then the things called gravity waves, where, which really involves upward and downward motion. Uh, and those waves uh, can either propagate in the stratosphere or down in the water clouds. And um, the prominent wave you see matches the speed of the uh, stratospheric, both of the stratospheric gravity wave and of the stratospheric sound wave. And we don't learn too much from that, except that because it's so prominent, it's probably the comet put most of its energy in the stratosphere. But from the speed <coughs> of the slower wave, which I think is down in the water cloud, we can learn a great deal about the water cloud. And, and in particular, we can learn uh, how much water there is on Jupiter just by the speed of that slow moving, uh, very faint wave there. And uh, of course, how much water on Jupiter is, is one of the big questions, because it has to do with uh, uh, whether there's oxygen on Jupiter and um, the hydrogen-oxygen ratio of the whole solar system. Andy, there's one thing you mentioned that I think we should uh, point out. You mentioned the greater visibility of the, the wave that appears to be in the stratosphere, and that's certainly true. But we have to remember that uh, even though uh, we see a wave in the stratosphere and apparently in the troposphere, uh, the one down deeper is probably going to be harder to see because there are overlying clouds that make things harder to see. The mechanism, uh, the condensation mechanism is producing a different kind of condensation cloud which may be more difficult to see. So the, the fact that we see what appears to be a stratospheric wave more prominently may reflect uh, conditions uh, that allow visibility rather than, than telling us something about the energy. So we just have to keep that in mind, I think. Although in, in, in our defense, uh, some I and some colleagues uh, took that into account before the comet hit in, in trying to decide uh, whether we could see evidence of this uh, deep down wave. And we concluded that uh, if it was there, we'd see it about as well as we could see the uh, stratospheric wave. Uh, so to some extent, we've got that one covered. But of course, we really don't know why we're seeing waves at all. Uh, you should hear them, but why do you see them?
We'll uh, be back here for questions later, but let's go first to uh, headquarters, then to KSC, and we also have questions at JPL. Headquarters, please uh, wait for the mic. State your name and affiliation. Go ahead. Uh, this is Dick Kerr, Science Magazine. Uh, Gene, uh, you seem to be the opinion that uh, Shoemaker-Levy was a relatively large comet before a breakup, that its fragments were relatively large. Uh, would you care to comment on Andy's uh, implication that much or most of the energy of a uh, fragment was deposited high in the atmosphere. The, the modeling uh, of relatively large objects hitting Jupiter had shown penetrations of uh, tens, if not hundreds of kilometers. Thank you, Dick, for that question. <laughs> uh, if Andy is right, and I'm not, some of us are not quite ready to concede uh, but if he's right, uh, I think that's very important. It doesn't mean that we're wrong about the energy. What I suspect it means is that as these comet fragments were coming in, remember, keep in mind that they're probably a pile of debris, just bound gravitationally. And as they approach, that pile of de debris is going to tend to be stretched out as it gets very close to Jupiter. And so it may be the reason that they don't penetrate deeply is they're getting spread out such that the individual smaller pieces are getting stopped in the atmosphere rather than one chunk just burrowing on down. And that, of course, was the $64 question. We didn't know how that would be, and I think we're going to learn. And, it, and if, if Andy should prove to be right, I'm just as excited about that as the other model. Uh, and I, but I think, we, I think it tells us something very important about the nuclei themselves. Uh, of course, it makes it a heck of a lot different problem to, to model, a difficult one. Uh, so it's going to be back to the drawing board and doing some very tough uh, numerical modeling now of a swarm uh, being pulled out as it comes in uh, as against a, 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 a single clump. But you still have the size of the swarm or the size of the single big object is still, you, you're still thinking it's about the same Oh, sure. Size. I think when we, when we look at the, at the rise of the plume, it's rise time and it's fall time, I think we can get, start to get very confident about the total energy be, yeah. being put in. And also, as, as people really start to analyze the actual thermal emission uh, from, the, from these plumes uh, in their early stages, that's going to give us the energy as well. Yeah, I, I Earlier I said five kilometers per second. I think uh, 10 kilometers per second is in the, in the right ballpark as well. There's, there's one thing about... For the <laughs> rise speed, the speed right. of the right. uh, plane. Well, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, there's one thing that this might relate to as we start to study the origin of this comet. Uh, yesterday there was a very popular question that got repeated to me several times last night. Is, is it possible that SL9 was not a comet but an asteroid? And I really want to lay that question to rest. Um, I think we go on the, on the uh, idea from the old Greek definition of a comet as being a fuzzy star or a hairy star, and an asteroid as being a, uh, something of star-like appearance. Uh, these are observational definitions, so that since we don't know uh, what, how this object started. We don't know if it might have gotten its origin in the, somewhere in the asteroid belt or if it got its origin somewhere out in the Oort cloud. But on March 25th, 1993, when the object was discovered, it was a comet by our definition of what a comet is. But, but it was it a uh, rock pile or a snowball? Well, that, that's something that, we may, that we're going to find out. But mm. it is a comet, or was a comet. That's something that's a very important question. And yes. Right. So. Yeah. We'll move on to questions from Kennedy Space Center, and please state your name and affiliation, please. Uh, yes, hi, this is Bill Harwood with CBS News. Two, two questions. One, and I'm for anybody about the, the water issue, and this is ignorance on my part. How long would water be expected to be detectable if you did, in fact, throw some up there? I mean, at the level you're seeing this stuff, is that something you would have to see during the initial moments? Would it be long-lived and you could detect it later? I mean, how does that work, number one? And number two, for Gene, back in May you said that it was, uh, you did not believe it justified the expense of trying to build something that could knock a comet or an asteroid down that was coming toward Earth. And I'm wondering if you've changed your mind after watching uh, the show this week. Yeah, let me I talk about the, the water. Um, the, emission, the emission band uh, that is at the position where uh, H2O uh, forms 
spectroscopic band was first seen in emission, and that means that the temperatures were high, because in order to get a gas to emit light, you need, you need to pump in energy and make it hot. They then report that the band turned from an emission into an absorption, which tells us that the, the water molecule cooled. Um, so we can, it, it did get heated up and then and cooled down. I think I'll stop there. <laughs> I think there's something we can add to that. If there's a significant amount of water uh, in the stratosphere, we ought to be seeing it. it, it won't, it's high enough in the stratosphere, I think, that it, it won't condense into solid particles at this point, and it should be distributed over a large area. And if there's a lot of water, we should be seeing it yeah. everywhere. Yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll try to answer the second question. Uh, knocking a comet down is a tough thing to do. Uh, and it's made doubly tough uh, for, the, for the case of long period comets. Short period comets, we have a chance of finding them, whether they're extinct or whether they're still active. We could find them with a survey, just as we could find uh, near Earth asteroids. Uh, but a long period comet can only be seen by continued vigilance. We have to just keep on watching the sky, and at best, we would only get about a two year warning. So, what to do about that? Uh, I think that's a really tough problem. Um, I, for one, am not one that's advocating that we, we have a standby armada of uh, launch vehicles and nuclear weapons to go shoot them down. I don't think that's the right response to the situation. Uh, I would say the impact of long period comets for the, for the things that are happening most frequently, uh, they contribute about 20% of the problem. Uh, and I'd be willing to uh, let that problem ride for a while while we try to find the other, try to deal with the other 80%, which are things that we can find, uh, which are likely to be found long, long before the hit, if there's anything out there with our name on it, on it that's going to hit in the next century, which is very unlikely. But if we found one, then we could think about real means of dealing that, with that and design a very specific mission to change the orbit. Uh, as, but as far as the comet part is, is concerned, you know, I think we just should ride with that risk. Uh, after all, we're dealing a, with, a, with the probability of something not hitting the Earth in any time that's equivalent to the total span of human history. Uh, so we could afford to take the risk a little bit longer, and I would think in the future our technical capabilities are going to change. They'll change dramatically, and we may be better prepared. Another question at KSC. This is Joe Chen of Earth News for Andy. Um, can you give us a rough estimate on what uh, the, um, the frequency of your acoustic waves, and if you're somehow to compress that band into the wavelength of the human hearing, what would it sound like? What is the frequency? The frequency, now it's easier to give an estimate of the speed of the wave than the frequency. <laughs> yeah. uh, it's probably a very low frequency. Uh, in other words, uh, you have to be able to see the crests and the troughs, the peaks in the valleys of that wave, and we can't see that. All we can see is the uh, radius of that ring as a function of time, and so we can learn the speed, uh, which is telling us something, as I say. But, a but Andy, what is the, uh, it, it's most, the most of the energy would be in the fundamental mode, and surely you know theoretically what that ought oh, to be. Oh, it's, it's, it's going to be a low frequency. Uh, you, remember, you remember the don't frequency have, of the uh, fundamental? You got not the in my you head. Got yeah. Not in your head. Yeah. Okay. As that uh, occurrences like this, uh, the comet smashing Jupiter, are as little as 80 years, as much as a thousand years that you just mentioned. Uh, any reason why you're leaning towards the thousand number, and uh, what's being used to, to uh, derive these numbers? Monte Carlo analysis, looking at the moons of uh, the Galilean satellites and the crater chains, or um, just numerical analysis and potluck guessing? Okay, I think that question was directed to me. We didn't get the first part of it. Uh, the estimate, the uh, so the basically the question was, what is the basis for estimating the frequency of impact of these objects? Uh, and it comes from multiple sources. First of all, we have the discovered Jupiter family comet. Uh, we also have the discovered long period comets, but it turns out at Jupiter, uh, the Jupiter family comets utterly dominate the uh, collision rate on the, ga on the Galilean satellites and on Jupiter itself. Uh, and so we, we already have a fairly large sample. We, we've observed about 150 uh, Jupiter family comets. 
And for at least some of these, we have estimates of the sizes of the nuclei. They're very difficult to observe, but there's a handful that have been observed well enough. We know their sizes. Now, we also know the size distribution by looking at the beautiful impact crater record on Ganymede, in particular the groove ter terrain of Ganymede, which is relatively young, preserves a, a complete record of the craters that have hit, uh, and, and we can make an estimate of the age of that surface, uh, and we can, get into, we can then get an estimate of the flux from that. But I use Ganymede to get the size distribution. Ganymede, the moon of Jupiter. Ganymede right? is the moon of Jupiter. Uh, but I use the actual observations of Jupiter family comets to estimate the number that are out there. So that's where the numbers come from, where we get the number of about one 10-kilometer body hitting Jupiter about every 1,000 years. Okay, and for, for Lucy, uh, uh, listening to the IUE reports and their emphasis on how they're spending 24 hours a day looking at Jupiter, I can't help but wonder why with Hubble uh, you're not getting the same um, percentage that I noticed that on the Hubble observing schedule you're still doing quasars, AGNs, and so on. Is this because uh, Jupiter is out of the field of view or that you couldn't convince uh, the head of the institute that this was justifiable to take over all of Hubble's observation schedule? Um, hmm. I don't know the answer to that. Could you repeat the question? Uh, give us the question. Uh, us okay, the question, as I understood it, was why was IUE looking at, at Comet Shoemaker-Levy 9 24 hours a day, and, and Hubble Space Telescope was not. I think part of the answer to that is there's an intense competition for time on Hubble, since it, it is a very new telescope and very superb in its capabilities. There's not nearly as much uh, competition for time on IUE. I think that has a lot to do with the... Uh, uh, and I'm well, not we sure who have been closest to the Hubble have no complaints about Hubble or the people yeah. who have been running or the time we've got, and so let's lay, lay that one to rest. Yeah, I, I went to, uh, to visit the, uh, the operation center for Hubble yesterday here at Goddard, and uh, I, think, I think HST, I mean, I, I'm wearing this tie very proudly today. I think HST did just one heck of a job with this comet. It is, it is such a blessing to have that telescope doing what it's doing where it's doing it right now. And, and we're also fortunate that IUE observations are complementing Hubble's. They're looking in different places. They're, you know, Hubble's concentrating on following the evolution of these, these objects. And, and IUE, the scientists said, hey, wait a minute, let's look at what's behind us. So they're, you know, those were some smart scientists that decided to uh, take another approach. So we're going to learn more from it. The other thing to remember is that both of these are in orbit around the Earth. Uh, and that Hubble will disappear behind the Earth for a certain portion of the time. It's only about half the orbit that Hubble can actually look at Jupiter. And so with two different satellites, with different periods and different orbits, uh, they're really complementary. So you get, more, you get more complete time coverage by being able to observe with two satellites instead of one. And I also want to add all the other observations from all the ground-based observatories, the whole complete data set is, is most rich in its combined form. I mean, each observatory has spectacular results, but the, uh, the wealth of information is going to come from co the combination and combining all the results, and it's unprecedented. We still have a question from Kennedy and also from JPL, and we'll make it back here uh, for some questions. Go ahead, please. Okay, this is Todd Halverson of Florida today for uh, Dr. Shoemaker or whomever might want to field it. I'm wondering if you had to sit down and make up a uh, top three list, uh, what the most intriguing questions are that have been raised by the impacts that astronomers may go off and try to answer in the next uh, several months. <laughs> well, as of this morning, uh, I'd pick out w one question number one, and it's in fact, it's been coming up all week. How deep did these comet fragments go? Uh, and there have been hints about this. We haven't been seeing a lot of water, uh, which we expected to see. Uh, if, if the comet nuclei had penetrated deeply, we're now getting uh, hints uh, from the study of the uh, gravity and acoustic waves. Uh, as Andy has reported, that maybe these things really did deposit most of their energy high. Uh, that's one of the real mysteries we want to get tied down. Uh, so I'd pick that as, uh, as mystery number one. Uh, mystery number two 
I would say is uh, we're, st it's, we're still betting on the come. A lot of people are making spectroscopic observations uh, of Jupiter now, of the spots, and we're wondering, you know, what new chemistry has been revealed uh, in these spots, and we're starting to get some of the answers in. So I expect some of the very exciting results now are going to come from the spec spectroscopy, which just takes time uh, to work on. Uh, so I, I'd pick that as, uh, as number two. Anyone else want to throw in a number three? <laughs> the, the, uh, are objects out there rubble piles? Uh, are they snowballs? Are they single rocks? What are they? Well, that's, that's part of question number one. I think we'll get the answer to that if we really know the penetration. And yeah. is there water on Jupiter? Yeah, <laughs> right. And is there water on Jupiter? Yeah. And just one more from uh, Kennedy here. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure who to address this to, but I'm wondering how uh, soon images from Galileo will become available and how they'll compare to what we've already seen from HST and ground-based telescopes. It'll be a matter of days. Uh, no, uh, it's going to be months. Mid-August, mid-August. The, the Galileo images will be uh, trickling down in a matter of months. Uh, they will not compare with uh, any of the images you've seen. Uh, what Galileo is going to contribute, and it's very important, really is the time history uh, of the flash uh, as, as the object goes in. Uh, and, and we're going to have, um, uh, because Galileo is around and can see the flashes, it's the only uh, object that, that has good cameras that can see the uh, flashes, we're going to get that time history, uh, which no one else can get. Andy, we've already got the first one. That, that's, uh, that's from the photopolarimeter, and we're getting the data down now. We've got two already. Well, I was thinking of images. <laughs> yeah, but, and, and but images will be coming down in a matter of months. Yeah, but, but the time histories are going to come from that photopolarimeter. True. And we're, gonna, and we're getting it. it. We're you getting got it. it right now. Yeah, I know on the Internet, um, the uh, Galileo team is, is still trying to get the best impact times so that they can choose the images they really want to bring down as soon as possible. Uh, you know, I'm kind of glad that, that we're going to get a little bit of an intermission after this wealth of data we have before... Uh, part two comes with the Galileo images because that's going to be a whole nother thing and really very exciting again when they start coming down. We'll move on to JPL, Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena. Please state your name and affiliation. Uh, David Garcia with Fox Television News Los Angeles. Dr. Ingersoll asked my question, uh, is there water on Jupiter? And I don't want to jump the gun, but I mean, the fact that even a provisional sighting, as Dr. McFadden was saying, is there. I mean, can you say anything at all about essential elements of life from this water? What was the last uh, six words? Say anything all, at all about what? The essential elements of life on Jupiter. Why? Life on Jupiter. Life. Central life. elements of life on Jupiter. Yes. Uh, oxygen, carbon, nitrogen, uh, and oxygen, uh, and hydrogen. Um, well, the idea that Jupiter formed out of the same material that the Sun formed uh, is so central to our understanding of the formation of the solar system that none of us can conceive of a Jupiter without oxygen. And uh, that's why we're uh, advancing these alternate hypotheses. The comet didn't go deep, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, uh, but of course, science, uh, can, every theory can be shaken. and. Uh, uh, the Galileo probe will enter the Jupiter atmosphere in December of uh, 95 and is going to get, uh, is going to penetrate the water cloud if it's there, and it, it may answer that question. Uh, but uh, certainly we were absolutely right to take advantage of this probe when it happened. Another question from JPL. Okay. All right, let's come back here. Do we have uh, any further questions? Matt Krentz from the Dallas Morning News. Um, I've heard a lot of questions in, this week about where some of these elements uh, and compounds that have been discovered are coming from. Um, is that an, um, really an important question? Because if it comes from the comet, can't you assume that in the past comets have brought it to Jupiter, uh, for example, water? Well, uh, the 
a planet like Jupiter is thought to form in a fundamentally different way than a planet like the Earth. Uh, Jupiter pretty much collected together more or less everything that was out there, all the hydrogen or most of the hydrogen, uh, helium, all the light elements as well as the heavy stuff. Uh, whereas the Earth really collected the heavy stuff, the rocks and the iron, and uh, may have acquired its lighter elements, the stuff of our oceans and atmosphere, at a later time, uh, and that veneer of volatile elements may have come from comets and so on. Uh, it, but Jupiter, uh, being as massive as it is, probably uh, formed and really sampled the solar nebula much better than the Earth did, and therefore uh, it probably drew everything in with it, including the oxygen. And that's why I said uh, we have a great deal of trouble imagining a Jupiter without oxygen. It would have to send us back to the drawing board on solar system formation. Now but Andy, uh, when you think about condensation sequence, even the material out there in the nebula at the, at the position where Jupiter formed, likely the oxygen was condensed out in the form of, of ice and then in the form of silicates. Uh, and they were then accumulated by Jupiter uh, and formed a core. Uh, and then the gas came down, but there were probably lots left over. So there may have, may have been many, many things like comets, perhaps 100 Earth masses of this stuff uh, that then was swept up at a late stage before the space between the planets was cleared up. Let me ask you, can you imagine a Jupiter without <laughs> oxygen? I've just told you how it got there as well. <laughs> so I think, I think the question, did they come in the form of comets? It's not, a, it's not an irrelevant question. I think it's a very <laughs> important Absolutely. question in how it actually got delivered. And in fact, yeah. all the giant planets may have a cometary component of, right. of ices and things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We have time for a few more questions here. And okay. Uh, Deborah Zabarenko, Reuters. This is a real quickie, but it's sort of an emotional one for you all. Uh, before the first impact was seen, I think it was Mrs. Shoemaker who said she almost felt like shedding a tear for this poor dying comet. Before you guys start arguing about what you've learned from this, do any of you feel, you know, post-impact letdown? Are you all <laughs> depressed that it's all over? <laughs> Postpartum depression. <laughs> <laughs> it's sad to lose the comet, but it did such a beautiful job. We can hardly be, be sad. You know, it, it's been such an extraordinary experience. We're learning so much. Uh, that uh, I would far rather have had the comet hit Jupiter than not to. I used to have a uh, post-Voyager letdown, uh, which <laughs> would occur during the months after a Voyager encounter. Uh, Voyager encounters were similar, uh, just a flood of new information. And uh, I'm sure I'll miss these good old days <laughs> in a few months. <laughs> Miles, Miles O'Brien with CNN. Um, Jupiter will disappear from Hubble view at the end of August, or so I'm told, up in Baltimore, and will not be back in view until January. Uh, how much will this hinder your ability to track the dissipation of these clouds? Uh, how much of a gap will that provide? We'll, we'll have time to analyze our data and think about what, what we learned from this summer. I mean, I th it's a relief to me, <laughs> but we will lose some information nevertheless. Yeah, that's why it's so important for the ground-based telescopes, which can follow Jupiter a little bit more as it gets closer to the sun, and the amateur telescopes that can follow it right into the twilight to keep on going. And then when Jupiter reappears later on in the fall in the morning sky, then as it gets higher and higher, the bigger and better telescopes will be able to pick it up again. But remember Spirex at the South Pole. Oh can keep watching Jupiter until sunrise is down there. That'll be about September 21st. And even as the sun comes up, uh, I'm not sure just what the conditions are at that telescope. Uh, they may be able to follow Jupiter even a little bit after sunrise. Infrared telescope. Thank if we could take one more question, and we need to wrap it up. Kathy? This is not a very poignant wrap-up question, but um, uh, Kathy Sawyer from the Washington Post. Uh, I, I'm not clear on what's left of fragment A that started all this excitement and hoopla. Is, are we seeing merely the heat residue, or is there still some brown um, comet stuff uh, hovering there still? 
There's in definitely a, in a package. still brown comet stuff there, and I think there will be for a very long time. And uh, I agree with Andy. I expect to see be seeing things a year from now. I expect things will be quite mixed up, though, and diffuse. I don't think we'll be able to identify individual spots a year from now. But we definitely see A is still there. Uh, at the same time, we see things are changing. Um, and, and I don't remember exactly what A looks like, but I remember that D and G were very well separated spots initially, and now they seem to have coalesced into something that's very peculiar looking. And I think tomorrow, Heidi Hamill may uh, have a story together on the short-term evolution of some of these things that we've been looking at. So come back tomorrow. I think that makes a pretty nice segue. Uh, yes, tomorrow at uh, 11 o'clock Eastern Time, uh, 11 a.m., that is, and Heidi Hamill will be here, as will Melissa McGrath and our, our other panelists um, will be here, and we will have uh, the, the latest information at that time and some information about the changes that are, we're already seeing on Jupiter over this last week. Uh, I've got a couple of program notes before we move on. Uh, for teachers who may be watching, in mid-September, NASA Teacher Resource Centers will have a comet slide set for you to use in the classroom. Yeah. To find the nearest, uh, the nearest center near you, contact NASA Core at 216-774-1051, extension 293 or 294, and we'll have a, a graphic with that coming up after the show. Well, here it is now. And uh, we will replay all the... the um, images and graphics uh, and video from the program after the program today. And uh, for those who um, would like to see it again or miss it the first time, we will replay this uh, press briefing in its entirety at 8 p.m. Eastern time this evening. And uh, I think that was all the notes I had to pass on. Uh, thank you very much for coming. We'll see you again tomorrow at 11.
Uh, we've been observing the comet collision with Jupiter using the IUE satellite as part of a very large campaign that has three separate U.S. science teams and a European science team. Uh, we've been observing 24 hours a day since the impacts began, and we've been using the unique capability of the IUE satellite to observe upper atmospheric effects from the comets 24 hours a day. We began in June to take a number of spectra of the planet without any comet having hit it so that we would have an idea of what to compare with. These spectra were obtained back in late June and early July before the comet hit Jupiter. This green spectrum is the far ultraviolet light that came from Jupiter's atmosphere at a location close to the dawn limb or edge of Jupiter. This first green spectrum was taken on the dawn limb at about 40 minutes after the impact occurred. And this second red spectrum here was taken on the dusk limb about three and a half to four hours later. And these wiggles are indicative of changes in the composition of the atmosphere that presumably are due to the comet passing through it and releasing a tremendous amount of energy. There was a considerable amount of darkening that occurred. And what we think we're seeing here is we're seeing the, the evolution of a dark region, the sort of dark region that people have been seeing in the ultraviolet HST images. We did find a mission related to the, to the impact of this fragment, but in addition, we found an extended trail of emission, very extending thousands of kilometers away from the planet. Originally, we thought this was associated with the plume phenomena, but with subsequent observations, we realized that what we're imaging is, in fact, the train of the comet as it approaches Jupiter. Um, this is really a very spectacular result because IUE right now is the only instrument that can, in fact, image the comet train. And I want you to realize that although all the major fragments have impacted Jupiter, there is still an extended wind of the comet uh, approaching the planet. And we plan to image it for many days to come to try to identify what are the processes producing this emission.
For more information about the NASA STI program, please write to the NASA Center for Aerospace Information or call us at 301-621-0390.